Okay, welcome back. I hope you all enjoyed lunch. Um, the next speaker is myself. Um, I perhaps first want to check whether online people are hearing me fine. Um, I'll wait until somebody confirms that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. Very good. Thanks. Um, so since Hi-Fi Sin is a project that centers on hybrid composites, it's not all we do in the project, uh, but it does center around it. We also wanted to have a presentation specifically on fiber hybrid composites. And so today I will be focusing specifically on hybrid effects and more generally synergies in fiber hybrid composites. Um, let me just fix that here. Um, so I want to start off with defining, wait, this is not working. With defining what a fiber hybrid composite is. If I were to say hybrid composites, it's a little bit ambiguous. Sometimes it also includes nanoparticles reinforcing a carbon fiber composite. But when it's a fiber hybrid composite, it very specifically means two or more different reinforcing fibers that are combined together. So this can be carbon-carbon hybrid, so a high modulus carbon fiber with a standard modulus carbon fiber, for example. Could also be E and S class. As long as the two fiber types are different, you can, in principle, get hybrid effects and, and synergies. What are now the reasons to use um, fiber hybrid composites? The most obvious one is to try and alleviate disadvantages of one or both of the fiber types. So for example, you add glass to a carbon fiber composite because carbon is too brittle. With the addition of the glass, it becomes less brittle. Walter is saying no audio. No audio? You want to check again? Yeah, can other people confirm? I think everything looks fine here. No, apparently it's okay. It's just one person. Okay, yeah. then, then he needs to fix that. Uh, okay, sorry for the interruption. Um, second reason is obviously cost. Um, if you add glass to a carbon fiber composite, you, you need to use less carbon and carbon is much more expensive than glass. So cost is often a very important factor. Should also not forget about design freedom. One of the big advantages of composites is that you can put the fibers in the orientation where you need them the most. You can do that even more when you have a hybrid composite because sometimes it's better to put the stiff fibers on the outside, cheaper and more ductile fibers on the inside, for example. Um, so you have much more design freedom. And the final reason is synergetic effects. And that will be the focus of my talk today. Um, I will typically call that hybrid effects, but essentially it's just another word for a synergetic effect. Now, there are, in principle, two different definitions for the hybrid effect. The first one is what is often referred to as the classical hybrid effect. This was sort of the one that was discovered the first somewhere in the early 70s. So here you see a carbon and a glass fiber composite. And if you now put them together, you get the hybrid composite. And it will have behavior that's somewhat in between. But there's one striking difference, and that is that the failure strain of the carbon fiber plies or bundles in that material is now higher. Um, and that increase of the initial failure stain enhancement is uh, the classical hybrid effect, which can be expressed as a ratio of the new failure strain versus the old failure strain. The second definition is to simply compare against a rule of mixtures. Um, if, you're, um, if you have the impact resistance of the carbon fiber here of glass fiber there, your hybrid will be somewhere along that rule of mixtures. I want to emphasize here that depending on how smart you are, this rule of mixture could either be complex or very simple. Um, so it is a little bit subjective what type of rule of mixtures you should use. If we know that there is a hybrid effect, should we account for that hybrid effect in the rule of mixtures? Yeah, then the hybrid effect will be gone. So to a large extent, this is a subjective decision that you have to take. Um, I should also emphasize it can be positive, the hybrid effect, but it can also be negative. Um, the same thing also applies to this diagram. Here, typically, it's positive, but it doesn't have to be positive. And if you would do the same thing for the ultimate failure strain, there we very often see it's negative. Um, so negative hybrid effects are actually also reasonably common. Now, I said that these 
definitions are in principle different, I think in practice they're actually the same. They are both um, reduced down to um, a rule of mixtures. Imagine the first definition for the classical hybrid effect. Essentially, that's a rule of mixtures at just a horizontal line. Um, if this is your carbon fiber failure strain, this is your glass fiber failure strain, you would expect, based on simple reasoning, forgetting about hybrid effects and everything you'll learn later today, that it would just stay the same. The, the carbon fiber failure strain should not change because there is glass present. So it should just be horizontal. What we see in practice, of course, is that it does increase. Um, and by how much, I will get to in a minute. I should also emphasize that I deliberately leave, leave a gap there um, because at some point when you have so much glass fiber added, you actually cannot recognize anymore when the carbon fails. It's just, there's not enough carbon anymore for it to fail in a way that you can actually physically detect. So there should be in principle a gap there. And if you do have data points there, I would always question the validity of those data points. So I've now explained the definitions of the hybrid effect. I will apply this um, and, and analyze four different important properties um, for hybrid composites. First, the classic hybrid effect, so the initial failure strain enhancement, then fatigue, impact resistance, and fracture toughness. There are plenty of others. I could have also included tensile strength, um, flexural strength, um, but I think these four are actually the most interesting and, and most relevant ones for hybrid composites. So starting with the classic hybrid effect. Um, if I were to ask you, what is the failure strain of a carbon fiber composite? Um, you would not have to respond to me with, with the answer, but you would have to respond with a question, I think. The question first would have to be, at what gauge length or what volume? Because size effects are inherent in composites. A larger composite will on average be weaker than a smaller composite. So the failure strain will depend on the size of the composite that you are testing. In which matrix is also important because when you have a polypropylene matrix combined with carbon fiber, it will have a lower failure strain than if it's one of the best performance um, epoxy matrix, matrices, for example. And I hope, that after my talk today, the third question you would ask is hybridized with which fiber or not hybridized at all? And if so, how well dispersed is that fiber, is that second fiber with the carbon fiber? Um, now, obviously not all carbon fiber composites are nicely zero degree composites. Um, most composites actually end up being multi-directional laminates or textiles, which typically also have more than one direction present in them. So if you look at what happens um, before final failure, Stepan already went into much more detail than I will today. Um, you will find on the micro scale, you'll find fiber matrix debonding and matrix cracking, which then eventually leads to mesoscale scale um, damage, like 90 degree ply failure, delaminations, and eventually zero degree ply failure. But what will control final failure is the failure of the zero degree plies. Um, it's only then that you get final failure. And that's also the focus um, of this part of my presentation. What eventually controls zero degree ply fail will be primarily fiber break. So you'll see quite a lot of references to fiber break development um, and how that affects and explains the hybrid effect. So if we can now just look at a zero degree ply and assume that all those other damage mechanisms do not influence the zero degree ply failure too much, which is probably largely true, but not exactly true. Um, I will explain how longitudinal tensile failure um, develops. We start off with the weakest fibers failing, and that's because not all the fibers have the same strength. Some are stronger, some are weaker, and it's usually follows this type of Weibull distribution. When that weakest fiber fails, it locally cannot carry any stresses anymore, and it will transfer that stress or that load onto the nearby fibers over a certain length. And that's what you see in the image here. The blue fiber in the middle is not carrying stresses anymore. And the fibers around it carry higher stresses than nominal. Those higher stresses will lead to an increased failure probability of the surrounding fibers, which are now more likely to break. So essentially, you have a tendency to create clusters of fiber breaks. Here you see an example of a triplet three coplanar fiber breaks. <clears throat> 
Um, these clusters, they have even larger stress concentrations. And so you end up in a vicious circle where you constantly have a, ten have a tendency to develop even larger and larger clusters. At some point, you will have one cluster that grows unstably and encompasses the entire cross-sectional area. And at that point, you will get final failure. Um, so this is the overall scheme. And this still applies whether that's a pure carbon composite, pure glass, or a carbon glass, or any other combination. Um, generally speaking, unless you have perhaps a polymer fiber composite, brittle fiber composites will fail in this way in longitudinal tensile failure. Um, then um, I want to make this point on the importance of the Weibull distribution because it will come back a couple of times. Um, I'm going to ask you a question, at which stress level does a composite fail? And I'll ask all of you to answer it, um, but I'll give you one, one important aspect is that this Weibull distribution that you see here is set up for the same length as the composites. Uh, because this will shift if you do take it for, an, uh, for a different length. So at which stress level will this fail? Will this fail somewhere here in the middle, somewhere to towards the left, or somewhere towards the right? Or you don't know, or you can't say. Um, so you should now all be able to go to... Oh, wait, it's not showing. Uh, that's because all everywhere is not installed here. Um, so essentially, you have to go to polf.com slash Swallows. I hope you can all spell my name. Now you can, I can check that. Um, usually it shows up here, but... Uh... It's not updating yet. You have already answered. Hmm. But you do, you can't enter it. Yeah. And because Paul is not. Yeah. You'll get a little bit more time until I fix this here. Everybody could enter. No. So you have to type polf.com slash his name, Yentel Swallows. Now, how do I now see the current one? Yes. Okay, maybe I should just give up. Okay, um, it seems that we have a technical issue. Um, you can still see that, that's good. Um, so who voted near the lower tail? Near the middle? Near the upper tail? So a little bit of everything, although it seems a little bit more towards the lower tail. Um, that is actually a correct answer. Um, that it will fail somewhere near the lower tail, um, but it's actually a little bit more complex than you think. And that's exactly the point I want to make. Um, 
So I can give you a, a numerical example. Um, when we test in longitudinal tensile failure in synchrotron CT, we can actually monitor these fiber brain developments. And typical values would be this. You have about 5,000 fibers that we are monitoring. We have about 500 breaks in that one cubic millimeter, um, which means that approximately 10% of the fibers are broken when our specimen completely breaks. Um, unfortunately, it's a little bit more complex than that. Uh, um, because if you have a larger composite, um, you will not um, be in this region, um, but your entire composite will actually, uh, you will have to look at a different Weibull distribution because now you have longer fibers um, and then you will end up here. So you will probably even end up closer to the left hand tail than you are in this case for the smaller composites. Um, so looking at Weibull distributions is often not very intuitive for humans. Um, essentially this, what you're seeing here, the fact that it's smaller here has to do with size effects. You're more likely to find a combination of weak fibers that will trigger failure earlier on. And that's why this, this white region here, I drew it smaller than in the smaller composites that I showed initially. Um, this is, Looking at Weibull distributions is actually quite important to understand the classic hybrid effect. Um, there is a very good quote from Manders, which is one of the first people working on fiber hybrid composites, that I think explains this very well. Um, he essentially says that the hybrid effect is not because the hybrids are so good, um, but it's because they are able to explore more of the potential of the carbon fibers. And in an all carbon fiber composite, you don't really reach that strength. So that's why we are at the left hand tail and we are not able to reach the middle. In a hybrid, you can just get closer to the middle because you can delay the propagation of, of clusters essentially. Um, I want to explain a little bit where then the hybrid effect specifically comes from. And there are three reasons um, that are mentioned in the literature. First is thermal residual stresses. Um, this can be illustrated quite easily. Um, if you think of a carbon glass composite that's curing at high temperature, at that moment, the lengths of the fibers or the length of the composite or the length of the part will be frozen in. Um, but then you're starting to cool it down. Um, at high temperature, they're stuck together, so they cannot move relative to each other. But at lower temperature, the glass, which is in this case a red material, actually wants to shrink a lot more because it has a much higher coefficient of thermal expansion. Carbon fiber is very close to zero or even negative. So that just wants to keep its length. Now they have to stick together. So that means that the glass will go into tension and the carbon will go into compression. So when we are saying that we're finding a hybrid effect, if it's purely residual stresses, essentially it's not a hybrid effect because it's just a... <laughs> It's just offsetting the applied load or the applied strain. It's not that the strain is any has, any has really improved. It's sort of an artificial effect in that case. The second thing is dynamic stress concentrations. And I won't go into much detail because there's actually also not a lot of information on this in the literature. The very basic concept is that when a fiber breaks, there is a dynamic overload. And normally we look at the static, um, the long-term the static stress concentration. Um, but in hybrids, um, this actually is a lot lower because you have stress wave interference because of the different wave velocities in different stiffness materials. And they eliminate each other a little bit more than they do in a regular composite. Um, but most important is fracture propagation. And this has to do with delaying of the cluster development. Um, in 2014, um, we wrote a review paper and we collected data on the hybrid effect um, and we made this plot. So you see there's actually quite a lot of sources that have measured the hybrid effect. Um, and in that paper, we immediately highlighted these ones as erroneous measurements. Um, because there from the literature, how it was described was very clear that they just didn't measure it properly. Um, there is also just an overall trend in green that you can see where you seem to increase from about 40 to 50% um, LE, in this case stands for carbon fiber, up to about 40% if you go all the way to almost 0% um, carbon. Remember though that I said that these data points 
I don't think they're real data points. I think they can know that the carbon fiber failed at that point. And yeah, you see negative high pit effects here. Essentially, it's, it's all over the place. And um, I'll try to explain you a little bit why I think some of this is, is so difficult to do and why there are so many erroneous measurements. Essentially, I do not really know which, which data points to trust. There are perhaps a few exceptions, but most of this, I wouldn't rely on it too much. So this um, very often has to do with the way we measure failure strain in a UD composite. And we'll have another presentation on that later in the school that goes into much more detail. Um, but you obviously have stress concentrations as the, at the grips, as Babak has mentioned. You can try to minimize them. You can add end taps. You can design the end taps. But you always have stress concentrations. And they can be 20, 30% higher than the nominal stress, which means Actually, if you do your test properly, it should fail in the grips. If it fails somewhere in the middle of your specimen, that's really weird. That should not happen even, um, even though that's what we really want. You also have issues with stress concentrations, uh, with, sorry, with Poisson contractions, which are allowed in the gauge section, but which are largely prevented in the grips. So you also get transverse stress concentrations, which are not always analyzed, but they also make splitting and premature failure more likely. And then very often we have no clue where they failed. Um, if somebody can tell me where this failure was triggered, you're a, you're, you're a legend. This, this you cannot see. You essentially need to put a high-speed camera in there to know where it failed. Do you know where it failed, Gergely? Yeah, I think in the grips. Both brushes are... Yes, but which one? As long as uh, the initial gauge. I, I agree that it failed in the grips, but you can't tell me which one. <laughs> there is no way you can tell. Um, so there are ways around this, um, and Gerge will go into much more detail on that, but I think currently the best approach um, is to laminate um, more ductile plies on the outside. Um, in this case, it's glass um, sandwiching carbon fiber in the middle. Um, and you can see that from this finite element simulation um, that essentially what you get here is stress concentration, but it's only in the glass ply. In the carbon ply, you can actually see that it's below the nominal stress, so you could say a negative stress concentration. And now this specimen, or at least in the carbon ply, should fail in the gauge section because there the stresses are lower than in near the grips. Um, and yeah, you'll see much more details of that. Um, but does it now make sense why there's so much erroneous data in here? Can somebody explain me why I have so many doubts about this figure and all the data points in it? Anyone? Especially the high fashion people should know this. Yes. Yes. So I, I will repeat. Um, so Rajnis is saying that because there is an error in the baseline measurement. And that's indeed true. I am explaining this method as a way to measure the failure strain of carbon fiber. But whenever you're trying to measure the hybrid effect, the same thing happens. So the baseline probably didn't fail properly, failed prematurely. And the hybrid either failed properly or at least much closer to properly. So that's why you overestimate typically what the hybrid effect really is. Um, and that's why I don't trust nearly any of this data in here, um, apart from a few exceptions. Um, I want to move a little bit into the modeling side because the experimental side in the literature is rather difficult to interpret. Um, but there's quite a lot of insights from modeling evidence. And very early models in the 70s and the 80s, they were just um, packings like this, where it's alternating carbon, glass, carbon, glass. That's a really bad way of modeling hybrids. Um, and that's what most people now also realize. You don't have a single carbon fiber next to another carbon fiber. It's always separated by a glass. You can't make a composite like that. It's simply impossible. Um, you have also only 50-50 ratios. You cannot do a 80-20 ratio. So you cannot study what the effect of the hybrid volume fraction is, which is a really important effect. Um, so more realistically, you should use this type of packings. 
um, but then you're still ignoring that the diameter typically is quite different. So you should actually be studying random packings um, with the actual radius as modeled if you want to do this properly and be able to study all aspects of hybrid composites. Um, so I will briefly explain the way our model works, but essentially the, the state-of-the-art strength models, they all work more or less according to the same flow chart. So essentially you start off with creating this RVE, representative volume element. You then gradually increase the strain. Um, and initially you just update the element stresses by multiplying strain with the modulus of the fiber. And then you get the element stresses. You then compare this to the element strength, which you have assigned on beforehand. Um, and initially nothing will happen. The strain will be too low, no fibers will break. So you keep on increasing the strain until at some point you do get a fiber break. When that happens, we first check, is that enough to cause final failure or the development of a critical cluster? And again, initially that won't happen, but then you have to update all the stress concentrations. Um, so the stress concentrations increase, the stresses increase. You check again, is there more fiber breaks due to that increase? Um, and you essentially go into loop two until there is no new fiber breaks developing. And then you go into loop one, you increase the strain, and you go back and forth between loop one and loop two until you detect final failure. And at that point, you can stop the model. And essentially, the only difference or the main difference between all of these models is how they do this part, how you update stress concentration, how you handle that. The rest is all very, very similar. Um, we do this with a finite element model um, where you have this random fiber packings. You incorporate also the difference in, difference in radius, in this case, between carbon and glass. And then you can start studying how does hybridization affect these stress concentrations. Well, you can see that as, as long as a carbon fiber is broken and not a glass fiber, um, essentially all the hybrids with different ratios between carbon and glass, they all more or less fall on the same line. Um, so it doesn't seem to matter whether a broken carbon fiber is surrounded by glass or by carbon. The stress concentrations are of the same level. Um, this is implemented in our strength model, and then you can start studying, for example, the dispersion, which is, I would argue, the most important factor in, in hybrid composites. So this is a simple case where you have a layer of eight fiber stick alternating carbon and glass layers. If you do that, we predict a hybrid effect of 2.2%. Hardly worth it, I would argue, and I'm sure you'll agree with me. When you reduce the ply thickness to just four fibers over the, the thickness, then you get 2.5%. Again, uh, hardly worth it, I think. Um, but when you make them even thinner, two fibers thick, then you get up to 10%. So that would mean a 2% carbon fiber all of a sudden has 2.2% failure strain. I think that's sufficiently large to be able to want to know that and ideally try to exploit that effect. Single fiber can go up to 16%. Um, very often when I present this, people think, yeah, but you haven't tried random packings yet. They are supposed to have the best dispersion. Well, no, they don't, um, because that's actually lower. That's about the same as a two fiber layer. It's about 9%. Um, so the best case scenario is to actually have uh, layers that just are one fiber thick. Um, and this is also a good way to illustrate the fracture propagation effect. Um, essentially, when you have this random dispersion, you have two fibers in this case that are broken. And the question is now, will it expand into a triplet? Will the third fiber break? The glass fibers won't fail because their failure strain is twice as high, let's say. Um, so essentially, there's four possible paths for that to happen. So four opportunities. In the single fiber layer hybrid, there's only two opportunities. It can only go left and right. And that's why... This dispersion is better because it blocks more of the pathways for that cluster to grow and hence we'll be able to delay it more than a random dispersion can. The way to do this even better is to move away from 50-50 ratios, add even more glass so you can isolate the carbon fibers even more, then you can potentially get even larger hybrid effects. Um, Second point I want to make is with these models, you can very easily study the effect of, for example, the Weibull modulus. So the Weibull modulus is a measure for the, the scatter present in the strength distribution. A low Weibull modulus, as you can see here, 
is an increased strength scatter, so a less reliable carbon fiber, if you like. Um, this applies to any type of brittle fiber. Um, as long as it has a lower Weibull modulus, it will go up. Um, this is something that's really difficult to study experimentally, but I think it's a really important part of the hybrid effect and how we can try to exploit it. Does anybody have a clue what type of fibers you should now use for hybridization to get the maximum hybrid effect? Which fibers would be good at maximizing the hybrid effect? Knowing this. Yeah, but that's obvious. And which fibers do you think have a low Weibull modulus? Flax is a good one, yes. Flax is a good example. Any other? Just low quality carbon. Yes, low quality carbon. And I think you can go two ways with that. Low quality could mean heavy toe carbon fiber, so 50K or even larger than that, because they're typically less controlled in terms of the thermal treatments that they go through. It could also mean recycled fibers, I think. Um, with all of these things, I think it still remains to be proven because it's measuring the Weibull modulus is not that easy. You need to do 100 or more single fiber tensile tests, and it's not done that often. Um, but generally speaking, these fibers are expected to have lower Weibull modulus and hence potential for larger hybrid effects. Um, then we also, yes. And also the question is whether we want to sacrifice overall good performance for high hybrid. Yes, of course, low yes. Fibers, we sacrifice some of the other Yes, so Gerga is saying that you are potentially sacrificing other problems. It's indeed better to have a high viable modulus carbon fiber, probably. Um, that, that is true. Um, but if you anyway have to use a recycled carbon fiber, it means it's more worthwhile to explore hybridization there than in virgin carbon fiber, for example. Um, so the next point I want to raise is about size scaling. Um, so in all of these models, we model really tiny composites, say a few millimeters long, a few thousands of fibers, maybe 10,000. Um, but we have to consider size scaling because it's an intrinsic part of the hybrid effect. It's part of the reason why we have a hybrid effect. Um, and there's one um, group that has now studied recently the, the hybrid effect and how it size scales. And you see that the larger the composite becomes, the larger the hybrid effect becomes. Um, so potentially this means that our models are underestimating the size of the hybrid effect. Um, I'm still saying this a little bit tentatively because I'm not fully convinced yet that this type of models that we really understand size scaling and how they handle that, whether they capture that properly. But it is an indication that perhaps we are underestimating the, the hybrid effect with our models. Um, next, I will talk a little bit about experimental validation. Um, so here, we took a carbon ply, we sandwiched it in between glass fibers to eliminate the stress concentrations. Uh, and then we increase the thickness of the middle carbon ply um, a couple of times to see what the effect of ply thickness is on the hybrid effect. Um, in the model, um, we found a nice increase from a few percent up to, uh, what is this, something like 13, 14 percent. So this, I would say, is more or less in line with what you also find in the literature. Um, and experimentally, we capture about the right trend. The experiments tend to be a little bit higher, Perhaps that's just the size scaling effect, which we, of course, um, we have to model much smaller specimens. Um, but it does seem that we capture the right trends and also the right orders of magnitude. We're probably a little bit too low, but there's also uncertainty on exactly which input parameters to use. So what's the implication of this experimental validation? Um, I think we do capture the main mechanisms. Otherwise, we would not be able to capture the ply thickness effect that I showed. Um, we, are, we were able to eliminate stress concentrations with this approach because they all failed nicely in the, in the gauge section and not in the grips. Um, and as soon as you go above a thickness of 100 micrometer, and I'll go back here, you can see as long as you are above this value, you eliminate the hybrid effect, which might seem like a bad thing and goes against what I'm saying. But this is a good thing if you want to use this approach to actually measure what the failure strain of a composite is. In that case, you do not want hybrid effects to cloud uh, the measurements.
Um, so we also did much more detailed validation by looking at the micro scale. So we actually want to monitor um, fiber brain development and how that changes in hybrid composites. Um, so we use synchrotron computed tomography for that. Um, you have your synchrotron ring here. That sound seems pretty small, but it's actually a few hundred meters in diameter. So much larger than what I show here. It gets a very bright beam through a monochromator. So we have wave, a single wavelength beam that goes through your specimen and through your loading rig. So essentially we can load this up while we are scanning it and continuously acquire images um, because here your X-rays are converted into visible light and then absorbed uh, on a detector which can acquire uh, images at really high speeds and afterwards reconstruct them in 3D. If you do this, um, you can, show, you can show this graph. And this one is a little tricky to understand at first, um, but essentially here we measured where the fiber breaks are relative to the ply interface. Um, and what we find um, in the first part in the, in the model, um, we, here we see that there's a sort of an increased tendency for those fiber breaks to be near the ply interface rather than far away. This is kind of normal. This is to be expected because the ply interface is not constant. The ply thickness is not constant. So you expect it to be a bit more likely to be near, um, near the interface. But experimentally, it was much more likely. Um, this means we're much more likely to find fiber breaks near the interface. Um, this was uh, based on a tin ply composite or a tin ply prepreg. And this shows that there's actually damage being introduced during the toe spreading process. Because otherwise the fiber break should be more or less homogeneously distributed over the ply thickness. And that was not the case. The interesting thing is that the hybrid effect will act much more on the surface of the ply than it will act on the middle of the ply. So this shows that thin plies are extra interesting for hybridization as well because they counteract the, the negative effect that the toe spreading has on the strength of the zero degree ply. Um, so general conclusions on the hybrid effect, typical values range between zero and 20%, I think that's realistic to achieve even though some people have reported much higher values. But there are many experimental errors and they're not easy to avoid. So. It's very important to always use proper reference values. Make sure that you have the right failure strength for your reference carbon fiber composite. Ensure proper failure and clearly explain um, where or how they failed. You need to show that they actually failed in the gauge section rather than the crips. But overall, the basics I think now are pretty well understood and we can use that understanding to design better hybrid composites. Um, there are some limitations in our understanding, um, but I think that's going to be a little bit too much in detail. So I am going to skip that and I'm going to jump to fatigue, um, which is the next topic. So if you look in fatigue, a fiber hybrid composite actually has been investigated since somewhere in the late 80s. Um, but most of the research is either unidirectional, tension, tension, or carbon glass. And in most cases, all three of them. Um, there are exceptions to that, and I'll show some of those exceptions, but most of them have at least two of these three features. Um, this is an example that has all the three features, was one of the first reports on, on fatigue of carbon glass hybrids, tension, tension fatigue. So here you see the, the fatigue line for a pure glass composite, which has a lot of degradation. Glass is not that good in, at fatigue. Um, and then you have your reference hybrid, which is somewhere in this band, and all the hybrids lie within that scattered band. So essentially, this means that in fatigue, they didn't really find any significant hybrid effect. It was sort of all, all the same, more or less. In another paper from the same year, uh, also 89, this was hybridized carbon with polyethylene. There they did find effects, but to show them properly, they extrapolated. So it, rather than up to a million cycles, which would be somewhere here, they extrapolated to show the effect more clearly. And you can see that the hybrids actually have a lower slope than the carbon fiber reference. Um, and if you, instead of interlayer hybrids, you make them commingled, then you got an even lower slope. So here shows that hybrids are potentially better, and especially when you have really good dispersion as in an intermingled hybrid. 
Now, recently, there's also been a lot of activity on pseudoductile hybrids. And in the last few years, there have been a few publications on how they fail in fatigue and what happens there. So this is an example um, where they were um, bringing the composite right above the knee point, um, then bringing it below the knee point again and fatiguing it then. So at that point, you already have one or a few fragments with some delaminations around it. When you then fatigue it below the knee point, those delaminations will grow, which you can monitor quite easily. And then you see that when you have um, at 70% of the knee point fatiguing, yeah, you see that the delamination already grows pretty rapidly at about 50,000 cycles, it's nearly fully delaminated. But at 80 or 90%, it happens within 2,000 or within 10,000 cycles. So uh, to me, that sounds like they're not that good once they've been overloaded beyond the knee point. You can see a similar story here, but here they actually did not go, go above the knee point and then fatigue underneath. Here they actually did fatigue below, above the yield point. And we'll be focusing on this data here. Um, in blue because that's a carbon glass hybrid. Um, and here you see the fatigue results. And um, when you fatigue at the first point here, that's near final failure. Yeah, you barely get above 100 cycles. That's, that's barely fatigue. Um, that's really bad. Um, at 400 megapascal, you get about 1,000 cycles. And at 300 megapascal, which is sort of at the end of the pseudoductile plateau, if you like, at that point, yeah, you get um, something like 10,000 cycles. So again, here, I think, shows that you probably should not be loading this beyond the knee point and just do everything below. Um, there is some work on tension compression fatigue. Um, and interesting here is if you do this with Aramid, because Aramid is really bad in, in, well, in compression and hence also in compression fatigue. And here they found, and I don't have a good picture because it's a pretty old paper and it didn't really make good figures back then, um, that the, the aramid was not detrimental to the carbon, which is actually quite remarkable because the aramid is so bad that you would expect a negative effect on the carbon and it didn't happen. Um, there is also modeling work on tension compression fatigue. Um, and what you can see here is when you have, for example, the purple diagram, that has the lowest fraction of carbon fiber, then it also has the biggest fatigue degradation. See, it starts on the highest here and it drops the lowest. When you increase the amount of carbon, the fatigue resistance or the, the slope or the overall degradation does become milder. Um, unfortunately, here it's really difficult to evaluate the size of the hybrid effect. So it's really difficult to define what your reference value should be. You have a hybrid effect perhaps on the compression strength in static loading, and then you have more hybrid effects in, in during fatigue loading. So how should you compare? This is really unclear, and that's why it's difficult to quantify this. Um, so for fatigue, it's quite clear that the data is scarce and pretty old, most of it. Um, there is some evidence of positive synergy, but others then found no effects. So it's not really clear yet. Um, and if there is synergy, it's difficult to quantify it. Um, I do think compression fatigue has shown some interesting promise. Um, so I think that's really worth exploring further um, because we on one hand, don't really understand it yet. And I do have the impression that it can be quite positive there. Um, then I'll move on to a short piece on impact resistance. Um, for impact resistance, there's actually a lot of different impacts. Um, so you can do Sharpie or ISOT testing um, with a notch in a relatively thick beam. That's not really representative for a composite. So I, I would disregard any data on that. We can look at falling weight impact and then specifically at penetration impact resistance. That's quite useful and then quite easy to analyze. You can also do non-penetration impact resistance and then analyze the residual properties like here in compression after impact or look at damaged area, for example. And you can also obviously do ballistics, but hybrids haven't really been used there. And I personally also don't see that much benefits in ballistics. So we are going to focus more on, on these two types of falling weight impacts um, to see what happens when you hybridize. So first for asymmetric layups, there have been quite a lot of people who've studied what happens if you put carbon on one side, glass on the, on the other side. And then flip it around. Which one is best? Should you put the carbon towards the striker side or the glass towards the striker side? And 
the outcome is unclear. It was better in some cases, worse in others. Conclusion, we have no clue. Um, luckily, I would argue asymmetric layups, especially when they're as asymmetric as they used here, they're not really relevant. So this is more of a, an academic exercise and not so much something that we'll do in, in practice. We can also um, take, for example, eight plies for carbon for glass and then use different layups, either all put them in the middle, all put them on the outside, disperse them and see what happens. So in this case, we're analyzing what happens when you put the carbon fibers more towards the middle. Um, for penetration impact resistance, the conclusion is quite clear. You should put them in the middle, essentially putting the more energy absorbing material, which is typically the glass towards the outside, then they absorb more energy. But for the other types of impact, it's pretty unclear. Um, some cases bad, worse, other cases better. Uh, there's repeated impact, there's only one study. And, and deteriorated or no effect for compression after impact. So we really need more studies here to elucidate what's really happening there. We also tried this in our lab and, and think some of the conclusions here are a little bit clearer. Um, we essentially took eight plies of carbon, eight plies of glass. Those are the two extremes here. And then we did all possible layup combinations in between and plotted the penetration impact resistance. The nice thing is we also took care of the, the, the scatter and you see that all our hybrids did better than expected based on the rule of mixtures. Um, and in addition, it's also clear that the, if you put the glass on the outside, they do better than when the glass is on the inside. Um, unfortunately, this diagram makes it look very obvious, but there's also another way to process this data and then it was a lot less obvious. And both methods are well, we can debate which one is better. So I show you the diagram, which makes it seem obvious, but yeah, in reality, it was uh, significantly more complex. So conclusion on the impact uh, for fiber hybrid composites, there's very limited fractographic evidence. Um, there's also very limited explanation of what really causes the synergetic effects that have been observed. Very often proper references are missing so they test hybrids and they test the glass fiber composite, but then don't test the carbon fiber composite. So what is the hybrid effect? You can't know because you haven't tested the reference materials. Um, there is overall pretty superficial understanding of what's going on here. So we, we need more understanding and probably need more numerical modeling to, to really understand what's happening here. And then finally, a brief part on fracture toughness before I conclude. Um, there are three different types of fracture toughness in composites. We can talk about interlaminar, which is delamination resistance, essentially. Um, you can also have intralaminar, which goes through the ply thickness. Um, in both cases, you don't, in principle, fracture any fibers, although it can happen from time to time. But in translaminar, you're really breaking through the fibers, so perpendicular to the fibers. Um, and I think both of these are relevant, interlaminar and translaminar. Intralaminar is often assumed to be the same as interlaminar. Um, so starting off with interlaminar, um, when you have a hybrid, you always have an interface between carbon and glass or between the two dissimilar fiber types. So you have sort of a hybrid interface. Um, we tested this for a carbon-carbon hybrid, one very high modulus and another more standard one. And you see that for mode one initiation toughness, you have quite different data for the references and the hybrid just goes back to the lowest value. So essentially that means when the delamination propagates, it just goes to the sort of to the easiest ply and it creates a delamination there. And that's why you see this, yeah, essentially going back to the lowest, pretty negative hybrid effect. Same thing for mode one propagation toughness just even more clear because this value is even higher than that one. Um, and then for mode two toughness, uh, we were actually surprised because here we had a very positive hybrid effect. The hybrid was much better than either of the two references. So this is what we call a true synergy, better than either of the references. Um, we, have, we had a few hypotheses, some of which we were able to reject and others which we can't prove. Um, and in the end, we don't know. We don't know where this is coming from. Um, and we also stated that like that in the paper. We, we've observed this and we checked all our data, but we simply don't know where this is coming from. <laughs>
potentially the crack jumps from one interface or from one ply to the other um, and makes it much more complex like that. But honestly, we don't know. Um, and then one example for translaminar fracture toughness, which is also quite revealing, I think. Um, here again, we tested the two references, um, woven glass, woven carbon with eight plies each. And we tested two hybrids. Um, the hybrids, um, they were either blocked together or um, distributed uh, or dispersed. And in the, the actual order, whether it's on the outside or on the inside, doesn't matter for this test. It's not a bending type of test. Um, and you see that here, it's actually better to block them together than to disperse them. So usually in hybrids, you're better off dispersing uh, because that creates more interactions and larger synergies. In translaminar fracture toughness, it's the opposite. Um, and actually, we could have seen this coming. This is something that's called the ply thickness effect. It's quite well known in translaminar fracture toughness. The, the thicker your plies get, um, the longer the pullouts can become and the higher the translaminar fracture toughness becomes. And when you block plies together, as we did here, essentially they're all magnifying each other. The best ones are magnifying each other. And that creates positive hybrid effects here. And here, the, 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 car, the, sorry, the glass fiber, which is the worst, is actually preventing long pullouts in the carbon fiber from generating. And hence, you get a negative hybrid effect. Um, so that's, um, I've discussed the four topics that I wanted to cover. Um, and I want to conclude with an overall conclusion. Um, even though the hybrid effect was controversial when it was first discovered in 72, it's very clear that it's real. Um, we can question how big it is, um, but it's definitely real. There's too much evidence to say that it's still a controversial effect. Um, but it is really important to get proper reference values and it's very often forgotten in the literature. So if you ever have me as a reviewer and you want to publish something on hybrids, if you don't have the proper references, I will criticize it for sure. Um, you always should consider the scatter because there are quite a lot of reports that say it's better than the references or better than the rule of mixture, but they didn't, don't consider scatter. It could just be a yeah, statistical artifact of the measurements. Um, and finally, generally improve the dispersion. It will be better for the hybrid effect, but not for translaminar fracture toughness. There, block everything together, avoid dispersion as much as you like. And with that, I will conclude and I'm happy to answer any questions.